Take a long, hard look at this painting from top to bottom for five seconds. What do you see? A woman dressed in a Japanese kimono? Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. Now, how shocked would you be if I told you that this painting, in fact, is the work of our very own Mr. Van Gogh? I'll come back to that. But first, let's scan this painting a tad bit more. Now let's see. You see a woman in a kimono, got that, and she has a belt around her waist and her hair tied high up. So my best guess would be that she's one of the mistresses to the king, maybe. But since the name gives it off, I already know she's a courtesan. Moving on from the female figure, what else do you see? It seems like there's some sort of nature background at the back and she's in the foreground of it, don't you think? There are lily pads, frogs, cranes, bamboo stems, etc. But these aren't just there out of the blue. Every part of this painting has hidden connotations to it. The woman you're seeing in this image is not just any woman, but a Japanese geisha. Haven't heard that word before? I'll explain. The Japanese word geisha literally means the art person. There are female entertainers found in the entertainment districts of Japan, so to speak. Areas where the rich and wealthy go to spend the night, and geishas ensure that they have a pleasant time in every way whatsoever. You get what I mean. But unlike most of the world, Japanese people actually respect geishas and hold them in very high regard. Yes, fellows, it's a full-time profession in Japan. These women usually had a specific hairstyle, gekko shimada, with their hair styled in a high bun. You see that in Vincent van Gogh's courtesan, too. The hair is tied in an intricate bun with a blue fancy tie to keep it in place. And then, of course, there's the bow-shaped belt with several shades of green to keep the kimono in place. The kimono back itself has very flashy reds, yellows, and greens on it, a classic trait of Japanese woodblock art. But the kimono woman isn't all there is to the painting. Notice how there's something weird yet interesting happening in the background. On one side of the picture, there are these two cranes, with white bodies and brown legs, and there are little frogs too. Water's flowing beneath them with lily pads and water lilies all around, as I pointed out earlier. This entire scene has a hidden meaning to it. Cru, i.e. crane, and grenwi, i.e. frog, are French slangs that were used for prostitutes in Paris at the time when Van Gogh made this painting. That's some serious foreshadowing happening. Also, see how the area above them is essentially just a yellow, abstract, fractal pattern. Now let's move on to the other side. What do you see? Seems like bamboo to me, extending all the way to the top. The background of the bamboo is also blue, by the way, the same shade as the water on the other side. So this is also the same water body extending to this side too, it seems. And now when you take a closer look at the background as a whole, you can see how it has a continuous naturistic picture with a mix of natural elements, fractal patterns, and abstract art of sorts. Not very realistic really, but definitely pops out and leaves an impression, isn't it? You have a nature escape in the background and a beautiful woman on a canvas in the foreground. This is a classic Japanese woodblock style that Van Gogh replicated in an oil painting, an adaptation inspired by a woodblock piece by Japanese artist Kesai Aisin. Remarkable, don't you think? Now let's address the elephant in the room. If you're a Van Gogh fan, you've probably seen his 1885 masterpiece, The Potato Eaters. Just a bunch of men feasting on potatoes. So you might be wondering, how did Van Gogh transition from that masterpiece full of realism to The Courtesan, an 1887 piece, in just two years? How did that happen in such a short amount of time? Did someone from Japan coerce our guy Vincent into painting for the Japanese? Or did he move to Japan and started painting there? The answer, none of that happened. Here's the story for you. Once upon a time, back in the year 1853, when Vincent van Gogh was born, the U.S. naval commander Matthew C. Perry sailed to Japan and convinced Japan to bow down and open trade with the U.S. and eventually Europe. Before this, that piece of land had been closed off to the rest of the world for a good 200 years, during what was known as the Edo period. Basically, a period where the ruler was an emperor and looked down upon the rest of the world believing that any foreigners would just corrupt the place. 
so he wanted to have nothing to do with the rest of the world. Anyhow, better late than ever, the borders opened and with the trade, out came Japanese art pieces that were nothing like the Western Impressionist art pieces or anything similar to what the world could possibly have seen in the history of art up until then. If you're an art geek, you've probably figured out what I'm talking about. But if you aren't, let me elaborate. The opening of the borders brought about a wave of Japanese woodblock art, or ukiyo-e, literally translating the pictures of the floating world. Floating world, huh? It sounds like a rather vague and abstract idea, don't you think? It's closer and more real to you than you think. The word ukiyo-e is in fact a Buddhist spiritual term used to describe how nature and life are orderly, yet so very spontaneous. Spur of the moment, so to speak. So likewise, the term describes a form of art that is full of colors and shapes describing nature in its full glory. The art doesn't have to be realistic, so to speak, but just should have you immersed in it, you know? And it sure does. At least, it got Van Gogh immersed in itself. Okay, coming back to Van Gogh and how he learned about Japanese woodblock art. The guy was a baby when this entire movement started, so how did he even come across Japanese forms of art, you ask? Back in 1886, Vincent Van Gogh moved into an apartment in the lovely city of Paris with his brother Theo. And that's where our favorite painter became the biggest collector of Japanese woodblock art. I don't really know how big his collection became, but it was definitely quite sizable. And you can see that from his words to the other Van Gogh, Theo. My studio is quite tolerable, mainly because I've pinned a set of Japanese prints on the wall that I find very diverting. You know, those little female figures in gardens or in the shore, horsemen, flowers, gnarled thorn branches, Vincent said to his brother Theo from Antwerp in November 28, 1885. Okay, collecting and all, anyone could become one. But how did Vincent's own art change just by collecting these ukiyo-e pieces? Well, it's because he wasn't just collecting them, he began copying them. In the beginning, he would basically pick up any one of the pieces from his favorite Japanese artist Utagawa Hiroshige and paint them in oil to the best of his abilities. With every single brush stroke, so careful and precise, that it seems as if he had learned from Hiroshige himself. And then, when he got the hand of these multifaceted Japanese prints, he began to make his own. And voila! Out came the first of the bunch, the courtesan. See now what I was getting at with this story. Aren't you glad you watched this far? In his own words, speaking of Japan utopically, just think of that. Isn't it almost a new religion that these Japanese teach us, who are so simple and live in nature as if they themselves were flowers? And we wouldn't be able to study Japanese art, it seems to me, without becoming much happier and more cheerful. And it makes us return to nature, despite our education and our work in a world of convention, Van Gogh said. The guy had never been to Japan himself, but I'm pretty sure that he probably wished to visit at least once during his lifetime. And while his dream of having Japanese and Dutch work together in art was never fully actualized, he became a legacy figure for both East and West in the art community. So the next time you look at a Van Gogh painting, take a good look to spot whether it's from before or after Japanese elements started coming forth in his work. And you'll soon come to realize that all of his works from after 1885 have Japanese connotations to them.